Okay, just a couple more talks to go through. Essentially, I wanted to toss out to you some ideas about large-scale capturing of biodiversity data. And John's going to throw out some ideas about essentially what would be the workflow for getting data all the way through to publication. Okay? So essentially, these are wrap-up talks. These are putting it all together. Um, and they're the product, of, I think, of a lot of thinking about, you remember that, that flow with the leaks? Well, what's the best strategy or what is a best strategy for plugging those leaks and getting as much data through to digital accessible knowledge as is possible? So when we talk about large-scale capture of biodiversity data, First, we know how, need to know how big the problem is. So John mentioned this, that everybody had always said three to five billion specimens. Well, there's actually a paper now that has taken quantitative approaches to estimating how many specimens there are out there in the world of natural history collections. And essentially, a good colleague at Arturo Arín, uh, in our named Arturo Arinho at the University of Navarra in Spain. But Arturo basically took information that he did know and used it to guess at information that he didn't know. So essentially, he looked at the relationship between the number of collections and the natural log of the specimens that they hold. Um, and then he's essentially fitting various distributions to that, um, that observed distribution and projecting them down to get at how many collections are there and how many specimens in those collections are there. So he, he ends up suggesting that, you know, okay, there are um, this many collections, essentially the estimate goes from, so these are, these are observed numbers and these are estimates. So observed numbers go somewhere between two to 4,000 and the guess as to how many collections really exist is more on the, on the order of double that. So something like 8,000 biocollections institutions around the world. And then you can do the same for specimens. And so from these known sources, you can see estimates or, or, or calculations of 650 million, 833 million, a very low one from GBIF, um, and f something around three quarters of a billion. Given the extrapolations that Arturo did, the guess is that it's somewhere between one and a half and two billion specimens. In GBIF right now, there is less than a hundred million specimen-based records. And so that suggests that we are one-twentieth of the way done. One-fifteenth to one-twentieth. Or to put it worse, 19 out of every 20 specimens in the world don't participate in digital accessible knowledge. Okay? So that's not very impressive progress if you view it by how much is left to do. If you view it by where we were 10 years ago, it's pretty impressive. Okay? So you can see the glass as mostly empty or a little bit full. So this is a little bit of a blast from the past for John and for me. Um, early on, as this debate about um, biodiversity informatics and sharing data got heated up, this commentary was made. Um, I would never ever name names, um, but let's just say a curator in our National Museum um, and I picked out some, some prize 
comments from him. First, relatively few specimens have been computerized. For example, this is 10 years ago, only 13% of 2.35 million skins in the three largest ornithological museums, that's the British Museum, the American Museum in New York City, and the Smithsonian in Washington, at prevailing costs, and notice that those prevailing costs are one and a half to two dollars per specimen, so that's also something of the past, computerizing the remaining specimens would cost between 3.2 and 4. 3.2 and 4.2 million dollars. However, accurate georeferencing might double or triple the cost. External pressure for computerization is increasing, but who, who will pay? Computerization is a lower priority than other urgent infrastructure needs. If such funds were available, wouldn't they be better spent on new biodiversity surveys. That gives you an idea of the mentality. The fundamental problem is not the free transfer of museum data, but to whom data are transferred and for what purpose. Free access to museum specimens and data has long been provided, get this, to bona fide researchers. To people that that person decides are genuine researchers. <coughs> And he concludes, until flaws in network safeguards are fixed, museum curators can better facilitate free access to museum resources and protect the interests of museums and researchers by handling data requests on a case-by-case -case basis. That's the Stone Age speaking to you, okay? That is a voice from the past although this person is not yet retired. All of the cost estimates are out of date. We know we can do it much cheaper now. But having three million bird specimens computerized that aren't computerized for three or four million dollars doesn't sound very bad to me. If that's what it takes. But my point in this talk is maybe that that's not what it takes. Okay, so this is, this is just to give you an idea of where we came from. You know, that's why I call it when smart people come to dumb conclusions. So this course has been all about opportunities. Okay, there are a lot of new technological advances that make data capture much, much more feasible. Just the idea of controlled vocabularies. Pick lists. You guys remember in, in my computerization group, it was, you know, how do you spell Douglas for Douglas County? Well, wouldn't it be better just to click on the US, click on Kansas, and know what the counties are in Kansas? That's really easy. Internet connectivity is a big piece of this puzzle. I know it's not perfect. We've certainly seen that in this course, in this room, but it does mean that all of this enterprise of capturing data from biodiversity specimens doesn't have to take place in the same place. It can be a distributed activity. Certainly, as we've illustrated with that last slide, there's been a global shift in points of view regarding data digitization and sharing. Now, what is normal and correct is that your data are digital and that your data are shared. There are exceptions. There are data dragons out there still. But really the norm is that data should be digitized and data should be shared. And one last point is how the world of biodiversity expertise and the world of deep biodiversity training is spreading out. There's now more and more of a significant population of very well trained, very capable researchers across the whole surface of the earth 
and not just in Europe and North America. So to me, those are kind of the major changes that have taken place in the last decade or so. So when we talk to any data owner, I use that word slightly cautiously, any data owner, and you say, what's holding you back? Why are your data not digital? There are usually three kinds of answers. But usually the main one is money. Okay, I've put that question to a lot of people in the big data holding institutions that are not always very active in capturing their data. And it always comes back to what that Smithsonian curator said, who's going to pay for it, right? Now, other challenges and impediments that you guys may face include access. Sometimes the politics of getting access to a collection can be a barrier. Let's hope it won't be. <coughs> and in some regions, as you guys well know, internet connectivity can be a challenge. So I saw some of you balancing between, gosh, I love Symbiota, but maybe I'll use Brahms. Why? Because my internet connection is not going to allow me to work nine hours a day, every day, all year. Okay? So those to me are kind of the significant challenges and impediments. But really it boils down to this. This is a phrase in, in Mexico. And it basically means, you know, with money, the dog dances for you. And without money, they dance you around like a dog. Or the translation could be, money makes the world go round. Okay? So really, a significant piece of this challenge is not the technology, not the smarts, not the willpower, not the hard work, but the money. What would we spend the money on? Let's say I give Pierre a, a million dollar grant and I want a complete biodiversity database of the biota of Togo. Complete, everything. What are you going to spend the money on? Think about everything we've talked about in this course. We're not talking about big, super expensive computers, right? We did, we did a decent rehearsal of a data capture effort on a bunch of small laptops. Obviously, for some of the image processing, it'd be nice to have maybe a big workstation with a big screen and everything. But even that is not a huge amount of money. Certainly, we need some camera equipment. But you saw the New York Botanical Gardens system, $3,000, something like that, $3,500. So again, in the world of funding for big scale research, that's doable. We're certainly going to need to move people around some, depending on where the people are and where the biodiversity information is. We're going to have to move some people around. But really what we're going to spend money on is people. Which is to say, what did you say, John? That we could get everything done in a year if only we had 15,000 people doing the georeferencing? Well, consider where in the world the biodiversity information is, consider where in the world the people power is, and maybe you start to see a solution. Here's a thought. Get the money from the international sources. You know, Alex has set a very good example with finding funding for the University of Ghana Herbarium. And there are several other sources opening up. If you've been paying attention to the uh, Facebook page for 
the BITC project. You will have seen that JRS Biodiversity Foundation just put out a call for proposals looking for innovation in biodiversity informatics and innovation in biodiversity informatics training, capacity building. People power. If you want to pay a full-time professional technician um, at an institution in Europe or North America, it costs a lot of money. But I think what you've seen is that a lot of the pieces of this puzzle can be done by young scientists who are looking for educational opportunities. Many of you are based at universities. That's how we did our georeferencing centers in Ornus and in the rest of VertNet. So that's a possibility of, you know, basically smart people who are still willing to work for cheap and in numbers. Collaboration is key, which is to say working together with the next country over or an institution that has a lot of biodiversity data from your country. I think there are fewer and fewer barriers to collaboration. And so we can look to kind of redesigning how we do these, these informatics advances. Always before, it was a single institution. You know, I was involved a bit with the, the capture effort for the Field Museum collection database, <coughs> BIRDS. And it was a nice big grant from our National Science Foundation. And it was all about capturing that one collection and getting the data as good as they could be. That was a single institution thing. At kind of a meso level, the VertNet grants, there have been five or six of them, have all been about institutions working together. And what we found was not only that we could get more work done by working together, but also that the National Science Foundation found it very hard to say no when you know, 20 or 40 institutions came to them and said, we want to work together. 20 institutions, 40 institutions. Or in your case, it may be multiple institutions in multiple countries. That's awfully exciting. So we can think about, and I'm going to stop talking very soon, and John will talk a bit, and then we'll all stop talking, and you guys talk. But we can think a lot about can we redesign this whole enterprise and make it eminently fundable but also assured of success. So just start thinking about those ideas. John's going to talk to you a bit about kind of the, the, the bird's eye view of data publishing. How to get data from start to finish out there as part of this global store of digital accessible knowledge. Okay?